people, I think all the experiences you've had in life some way somehow makes sense eventually. Hey guys, welcome to How They Did It with Trisha Biz, a show that takes you behind the scenes of successful African entrepreneurs, change makers, and creators, showing you the journeys that led to their success. This episode is sponsored by Traction Apps, the growth partner for your business. So today, I am standing in this wonder of 10,000 acres. This is a large commercial rice farm in Ghana, owned by Ghanaian. It is the largest, actually. We'll be talking to the founder. His name is Nana Owusu Echao, founder of Agro Kings. They are the producers of Nana's Rice, a popular brand here that is also exporting to other countries in the world. We'll find out his journey, how he started, and most importantly, how he is solving the food deficit issue we have in Africa. How does somebody relocate from the US, come to Ghana, and build this monster of a business to create food. Let's go. All right, guys. So we are live here in where are we, sir? Kasunya <laughs> Nyapienya in the Akuse Estuary area. Akuse is. Don't worry. Don't, don't, don't try. Yeah. Don't try. Don't try it at home. <laughs> so we are in. Um, Say Kasunya. Kasunya. Yes. Great. So I'm live with Nana, and he is the founder of Agro Kings. Um, popularly, uh, they have a popular brand called Nana's Rice. So welcome to the show. Thank you. Great very to have much. you. It's a pleasure to be here. Fantastic. So tell me about Nana. You were born here. You grew up here. Mm -hmm. So I was born here in Ghana. Okay. Um, born in Accra. Okay. Uh, my parents are originally Chi and Fanti. So my dad is from the Brongahafu region, which is a little up um, up north Nuts. a bit. Okay. Um, more like the middle belt of Ghana. Then my mom is from down south. Um, so yes, but then they, they met in Accra and that's where I was born and that's where I've lived um, all my life. So yes, I was born here in Ghana um, in Accra. Um, went to school here, mm -hmm. primary school, junior high school, senior high school. So senior high school, I went to a boarding house. So then I went to a school out in uh, Kumase, which is okay. in the, the other city that most people know apart from mm, Accra. I know Accra, Ghana. I know Kumase. Exactly. So yeah. I went to school in Kumase, a, a college called Prempe College. It's not a college or university. It's actually a senior high school. Okay. So I went there for boarding school and it was my first time of staying long away from, from, from home. Um, and for my parents. And so I was there for three years and then I graduated and then came back to Accra. I worked at the American Embassy and then I went for university in the US. Okay. So that was in 2008. And then I got back to Ghana in 2012. So yes, and then I, I moved, I've been here since. I, again, I do go back and forth quite a bit, but I'm, I'm well, mainly- This is your base. Uh, yep, based in Ghana. Wait, so I understand that you had a Wall Street opportunity? <laughs> yes. Yes. Okay. <laughs> so, so, yes, I did have a Wall Street opportunity. So I graduated. For, I, in fact, I went to school thinking I wanted to be a pilot. Ah. I'm not a pilot. I was thinking about an aeronautical engineer. Okay. The real reason is because everybody thinks, hey, if you are good at math, if you are good at science, That's the way become forward. a doctor or become an engineer. Um, so I was following people's um, ideas and stuff. But when I got there, I realized I really enjoyed technology and I felt like technology was something that we're lacking here in, in, in Ghana and in Africa. Mm. And so I switched to computer science and information systems and then I made engineering a minor. So now when I graduated, of course, everybody then also tells you, look, you've gone to school in America, you've paid dollars for school fees. Why don't you like make some money and then you move back? Mm -hmm. um, so of course, you know, pursuing opportunities, I ended up uh, on Wall Street. I was in New York for about three days. Um, I was specifically going to Dutch Bank. Okay. And I was like, no. This is what um, it's... No. Yeah, I felt like, look, I remember there was a day I was going to, I was going to go out to go grab pizza. And then the, the, the lady at the reception had said, you know, just be careful while you're out there. That was, that was my trigger. <laughs> I'm like, where am I living where I'm being asked to, like, be careful as I get there? And yeah. I'm guessing maybe just the area in which I was, I, I was living. Um, no, so you live in Brooklyn. Yeah, honestly, I don't. I don't even know where I was. <laughs> um, I, I didn't even get to settle in. Okay. Because here I was. I'd come in, you know, trying to you know explore this opportunity. 
I was there and I was like, no. So I actually took my luggage with mm. me to work. And then I just said, hey, guys, I, um, I will not be able to, you know, continue here. Straight from there to the airport. And then I was on my flight back to Michigan. So, I, again, my school was in Michigan. Okay. So I flew out to, to New York. To New York. To so I just flew changes. back to Michigan. Then I, I, I came back to Ghana. 1st August 2012. You know, I asked this question um, when I was talking to somebody else here in Ghana. I'm like, who leaves a developed world to come to come to a developing? In fact, I don't know if what is developing or I don't know what category. Underdeveloped. Yes. <laughs> who does? Why? Who does that? Like everybody's looking for opportunity to to relocate to over there. Yeah. I think also that the fact that I was there gave me the opportunity to know what was there and how it was done. Okay. So I spent a lot of time. You know, I visited a few companies. So I even went to China during my, 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 my study there. So I was in China for about a month, just having a semester abroad type of program. Mm. And most of the time I was just like, you know, meeting with, you know, people who had been in industry for a while, people who were business owners. And then I realized there was a trend. Okay. There was, they either moved in early or for some of the people, it was just that, you know, they had worked and they were so good at what they did, they were valuable to whoever they worked for. Mm. So, in fact, the simple answer to the question is, if you are really looking for leapfrog opportunities, you will not spend time in the developed world because what you are doing in your mind is you're saying, hey, you know what, these guys are developed. They already have everything, everything. in place. Mm. You know, technology is not a big deal. Who cares? But for us in developing countries, it's like there's little there's so to many. no opportunity. So, mm. you know, any mm. little thing you do, anything you do little differently, you are seen as like, deal. yeah, mm. doing, doing something that's a, a very big deal. Okay. And I guess you hear more of that even when we talk about the farm and how I ended up. Yes. Uh, okay. So you are, you are back in Ghana. Mm -hmm. Fantastic. So what, what did you, how did you go about, what did you do? Similar thing. So I came back to Ghana and I thought, hey, you know what, let me pursue an opportunity in what you call the big four. So, you know, you have PwC, KPMG, Deloitte, Central, Intuition. Deloitte, yeah. Yeah. So, here I was, when I came back, I thought, you know, let me go look for a job. You know, US grad, let me come look for a job. In Surely you should get force. the job. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and so, I did that. In fact, there was, a, there was a unique meeting I had at some one of my interview sessions. I can't mention the name now, but mm. one of them, one of the people who worked there, worked there and said, hey, you know what? You look like someone who one day, this company will rather pitch for business. It may have been the voice of God. It may have been an angel speaking to the guy. I don't know. But I remember leaving that day, and I didn't think much of it. But I remember going back home and thinking to myself, you know what? He may be right. Mm. Um, and so I did not take that opportunity as well. I was there for a couple of days. Not a couple of days. In fact, I, I think my final interview, I was then told to come for orientation. I didn't. And I just Are told sure? them, hey, I'm not going to. I'm not going to take the opportunity. And so I then moved to work with my dad. It was in the real estate space. So okay. um, I then moved to work with my dad as a business development manager. I think the, jo the job they give the son of a business owner <laughs> when he comes into the business. So I was given the role of a business development manager. And honestly, I felt like I was always battling with my dad. I was always mm. the type who, hey, why are we not on a website? And then he says, well, I've contacted somebody and I don't like the person who's building the website. I don't like the look of the website. Then he's paying him so much money. Here, here I am as a young guy thinking, no, you know, I can get better value somewhere. So I felt like we kept having loggerheads. Loggerheads. We kept mm. going back and forth on what should be done and how things should be. Mm. And so I just thought it best. Look, if I have an opportunity to move out, I would. Um, so I began to put a few things in place here and there. I started working with my dad in August. By March of 2013, I had already started my real estate business. Okay. Now, how I started was, I, like I said, I, I, I met with an architect that I, I liked. You know, so my dad was in the business, so he had architects. When I talked to them, they were not listening to me as much. Yeah. So I found like younger architects, younger quantity surveyors, younger builders, and I was engaging with them. Eventually, a friend gave me an opportunity to build a house for them. Okay. So then I used that as a launch pad to start my own real estate, real estate business. business. Hmm. And I didn't start it out like, you know, antagonistically with my dad. I just decided. So I bought land for my dad. He actually took he the money. He didn't see you as competition. Oh, no. I was, because I was giving him cash. Okay. So I came and I bought his land. Okay. Then I built it out. And the whole time I was building, he was laughing at me. <laughs> because to him, I was like, dude, what is this guy Joke. doing? Yeah. You know, I own the big business. He says he wants to do this small thing. Look, dude, you're on your own. But hmm. hey, today... I think he sees value in what, what we've been able to achieve up to now. Mm, okay. I hope he does. Yeah. I, think, I, think, I think so. Yep. Um, so, okay, that business is thriving. Mm -hmm. 
um, then how did you exit that business so and I move actually, into agriculture? I actually haven't exited. Okay. So what happened is I started out in 2013. Similar thing, I met someone who wanted me to build out a resort for them on an island. Mm. So then I had to come out to this town, the, the Sichuari community, to come look for that island because it's there's there's an there's what there's an area that's called the biggest island in West Africa. I never knew that. Mm. So I went to this, this island. Floating island. It's not floating. So, so it's surrounded by water. Okay. People live there, okay. and they only commute there by by boat. Yes, ah. canoes actually. Not boat. <laughs> okay. Boat sounds too. Boat is very They go by canoe. <laughs> okay. So um so that happened um and while I was there, when we got back from the trip, the chief then said, "Hey guys." Like, try the rice that the people in my community grow. Hmm. So then I tried that rice and it tasted really good. I then wondered, Charlie, this is the rice I'm going to start buying because this is local rice as opposed to the imported rice I used to buy. Okay. So that's how we got started. Now, when I came back into the community later on, following up on the same real estate project, then the guy said, hey, Nana, Charlie, we don't have any more of that rice hmm. because that rice, there's a unique way to grow it. It's a little bit more expensive to grow. So at this point, we don't have we some. Don't have and I said, look, you know what? Get me some guys. I'll give them the requisite training to grow with that quality. And then I'll give them the difference the so that they can actually grow that quality for me. Okay. That was how I kind of came into the agriculture. So it was not something I did. I didn't have a hard stop at real estate and then started agriculture. Okay. It was it's just an kind of, yes. And I just, you know, um, did that. I'd always known that agriculture is good for the African continent, but I just oh. didn't have an entry point. So even prior to this, I had some other agriculture engagements, but this was really the major thing that, so I started by working with two of the farmers and then today I work with about 300 of those farmers. So it's just something I have grown and scaled up organically over the last, I started that in 2017, so over the last five years. Five years. Okay, so, so let's talk about this model mm -hmm. uh, because the average um, agricultural entrepreneur want to farm themselves uh, to try to, I don't know if it's to maximize the profits, yep. etc. But you went a different route where mm -hmm. you're empowering uh, local farm farmers. farmers. So why did you decide that that was the best model and not just take your training and train your own farmers? Right. I think a part of it was also just the technical know-how was, was not there. I'm not an agri, I don't have an agri background. And I think that there's a bit of a mindset shift that needs to happen for you to decide to do that. Mm. I believe it's better for me to own 1% of a of, million yeah. than own 100% of a thousand. Okay. So um, just because of the knowledge share that happens, because of the, of the, of the, of the capital that, that's required to be able to start a venture by yourself. Mm. And so I think that I always had this idea that, look, if these guys know how to do it, and I can just give them the funding they require. And I was connecting. So what I did is I connected the trainers with the farmers. Okay. Then I told the trainer that if you train them to farm well, I also need you guys to give me supervision over them because I don't know what supervising them to follow the protocols you have trained them to follow would be. So the, the, the trainers agreed that I give them money to train the farmers and I give them money to also supervise them. Okay. And then they also get a, get a, get a percentage on the yield Perfect. if it goes well. Uh, so that they were motivated well, enough to oversee them. And then my cash was also then preserved as I gave it to, to the farmers. So that was why that happened that way in the beginning. I had no clue. Again, this is about two hours out from the city Africa, where I was yeah. living. And so I, I wanted to just, you know, test out the waters a bit. And then, so like, you know, we, we started with two farmers. The following season, we worked with 25. Then we worked with 100. And now we're working with 300. How long is one season? Uh, four to six months. Four to six months. Oh, so there's 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 a the from the day the plant is seeded mm -hmm. to when it's harvested it's about four months but you have to have land preparation that happens about a month you have to have post harvest like you know drying the rice milling the rice and stuff like that so typically you would see about six, six months. months this is me interrupting your watch time to tell you to like this video share it and also subscribe to my channel you're still watching how they did it with trisha biz okay so this model is working so at mm -hmm. what point in time did you decide that you wanted to get your own farm so uh, is the beauty of organic growth I see? Um, simple answer to the question is COVID. 
the longer answer is so like i said we started working with two's farmers then i went to 25 and i went to 100 now of course at the minute we went past 25 i had to do more supervision myself okay so i visited the farm a lot more during that period mm. then there's something i observed when i came to the field that walking through 25 farmers farms was very complicated because it may be scattered, yeah, scattered. across exactly oh, okay. so okay. the idea was wow how do we scale this because now when i came into the community in a day, I couldn't get through 25 farmers. Uh -huh. And so what I then realized I needed to do was I need to find a way to either bring all of them to one area mm -hmm. and then to I'm able to make permissions a lot easier. So that was the idea around coming to acquire a piece of land in this community. So like I said, Kasunya Nyapenya is a community within a larger area where I started the farmers, started working with the farmers. And mm -hmm. so this is where I was able to find land that I can get water and all of that. And so that's why we moved to look for a piece of land. In fact, when I started out, the plan was to get like maybe 100 acres, mm. maybe 200 acres. Then I'll move my farmers out there. Yeah. However, on my way to the, the farm, I passed through the Golden Exotic Farm, which is a banana farm. Oh, we saw, we saw it coming huge, here. It's huge. huge. <laughs> and it's actually owned by French. Okay. A French company, and they are all across Africa and even some parts of um, South America. Okay. And just going through that farm and just seeing what was going What's on, I was like, "Possible. This is, this is, this is, this is possible." Mm. Um, they have like over three thousand six hundred workers. Wow. You know, they, they are, their land spans, and I think maybe about eight to ten thousand acres. And so, when I got in front of the chiefs, looking for about a hundred, but going through that. <laughs> What just came out of our mouth was 10,000. Ah. So that's how we ended up like acquiring such a large tract. Now, of course, when you're talking 10,000, the people who live in the community alone are not even up to 1,000. Mm. So then the point was then became, okay, we may have to have what we'll call a nucleus farm where we run as a commercial scale farm. And then we can also dedicate a section of the farm to our smallholder farmers. So that's what, that's what we, have, we have actually decided to do. So we are training more people to be able to come on the field. And then we also have a section of it which is called our nucleus farm where we do our own commercial Your own scale farm. farming. Yep. Okay, so how did you how were you able to fund such a large purchase? So thankfully, it was we have payment terms about 10 years. Oh and so that's it's genius. not it's not a lump sum. Lump sum. Okay. So I had to give them an initial commitment to be mm. able to move on to the land, and then we have a, an arrangement to pay them every single year as the project also um, skills up so that was and then I, and I mentioned to you how covid was there was a big trigger yeah so it's something we had always thought about so we said hey you know for us to move from 25 to 100 we need to acquire land we need to acquire land but you know the process of acquiring land is so complicated mm -hmm. you go to visit different lands you're trying to, to confirm if the land belongs to them or it's not the authentic documentation and all that was mm -hmm. very so it took us a while now covid caused everybody to now go on lockdown Stay at home. Yeah. and then we were considered essential services because when i started food. working the two yes go in the food business mm. so then it gave us a pass to, to move to around, move around. Mm. so then of course now when we when we so and in fact i bought a delivery van right before lockdown in fact the weekend before the country went on lockdown we got our delivery van mm. and we just branded it okay. so when we're going through town it was easy so in the mornings we we're able to go through do all our deliveries to all the different people who were some people were buying for their homes some people were buying to make donations so when we finished that then we had all the time to search and for there was one. no traffic yeah so then getting here was very easy easy mm. so i managed to move out here we we're able to spend more time here as well because it was covid we didn't want to be moving around too much mm. so when we moved out here we got to spend more time on the field and then we saw how this was possible okay the section we'll use for smallholder farmers the section we could use for a nucleus farm how we'll do our irrigation so mm. during covid a lot of work went in into this yes because there was a lot of um downtime for everybody interesting so i i read that um Nana's rice is uh, is a Ghanaian brand. It is grown here. Did the seedlings come from here as well? Yep. Because the average seedlings come from no Yugoslavia. In fact, the seedlings come from somewhere in Europe. University of Ghana. Ah. And in fact, I used a unique hybrid that was actually made here at the University of Ghana. So it's a brand of um, jasmine rice. Okay. I like and jasmine. Jasmine is long grain rice. Yeah, long grain rice. Okay. So it's long grain rice, and, and, and it has a fresh aroma. Okay. In fact, even on the field, when you, when, you, when you visit the field, and the plant is about a month and a half old, you can already 
smell it in the air. It's just mm. this freshness. And all of that was made right here at the University of Ghana. Mm. So we so we we took what we we'll call a foundation seed and then we we reproduce that seed. Okay. So a foundation seed. So I never knew much about rice until I came, so don't worry. <laughs> and I love rice, it's probably all I eat. Yes, so the average African. What I should do is let me grab some rice because I can see some rice here. Okay. Take it from the bottom. Okay. So right here is rice. Ah. So this is what you are eating when you eat rice. Okay. This is a grain. Yes, this is a grain. Okay. So this is green. So it's not as dry. Mm -hmm. Rice, this thing is a seed. And the okay. same thing is the rice. Okay. So in fact, when I open this, it will probably be a little milky. Yes. Mm. So you can see it's a little milky inside. Okay. That's the rice. But it's getting a little hard. Mm. So I just broke it, right? So what happens with rice is that this seed is planted and then it produces a plant like this. Okay. So one seed goes in the ground and produces multiple seed. Mm. Then this needs to dry up. So when it dries up, then it's ready for harvesting. At the point of harvesting, once I open this, you will see what is inside is white. Mm. So this chalky is, is kind of milky. And so once it dries up, it will just become, it will form what you would call rice. Uh -huh. So what we took was, we took the foundation seed, which is the original seed from the university, and then we started replicating that. So do you use transplanting seeds. or I think there's like different methods? Yes, transplanting versus broadcasting. Broadcasting, yeah. When I was working with the smallholder farmers, transplanting. Okay. But at this scale, transplanting is a dream. <laughs> <laughs> because I had to probably employ eight people to plant a hectare mm. in a day. Now, With broadcasting this, is way easier, it's so it's way less, easier, yes. less it's human resource. Oh, okay. And just practically, it will probably take me more than a month to plan just what you see here as plot one. Uh, so it's just practically, it's not, it's it's not, not going to work. Not now, the hope is that I should get a transplanter. I haven't found a good one yet. Okay. I've seen a lot of people who say, you know, we have a transplanting machine, but none of them have worked well. Well for you. Yet. So we still currently use the broadcasting. But in fact, I met with a Chinese this month, last month, he had spoken about, hey, even in China, we are now doing broadcasting. Now, mm. Chinese produce, they are the largest producers of, of rice in the world. Mm. So if the Chinese are using broadcasting, who am I? Who are we? <laughs> so, um, so it's a full, full African brand. Yep. That's fantastic. Yeah. Um, so how, how do you get about your claim? I, I read the claim is, is tastier, there's more quality, it's better. Mm. How? Is that possible? Yes. Not to bash imported brands, but in reality, note that, just practically, mm -hmm. if your rice came from a place like Vietnam or Thailand, just how many months it sits on the sea like gives you an four idea. Four months, yeah. Most probably, that rice has been stored for a while. In some silos. Exactly. Okay. But here, what you're getting, when I, when I harvest, I dry, I mill. It's in the bag. You buy it. Mm. So what you realize is the same cup of imported rice you probably consume and the same cup of local rice you probably... This will probably fill... The local one will fill you up more mm. and will feel also a lot fresher. Mm. So that's that's what we are getting as feedback from a lot of people. I've, <laughs> my favorite of all of them is, hey, when you cook some imported rice mm -hmm. and you leave it out without putting it in the fridge in the overnight... Fridge. Mm -hmm it would come out moldy. Yeah. That does not happen with that really? rice. Ah. So that should just give you a sense of, you don't need to put that in the fridge. You're good with this and living here. So we realize people feel like it's tastier. People feel um, it, it's more filling. Mm -hmm. um, and this is the kind of feedback. And, and oxy, there's, there's this misconception about aromatic rice. We do not spray any kind of perfume <laughs> on the rice. <laughs> on the rice. Aromatic rice is a part of the it's a part of the plant. Okay. So there are just varieties that are aromatic and there are varieties that are not. Are not. So like you see, there are basmati, okay. then there's long grain, there's mm. short grain, there's parboiled. It's mm. a, just a variety uh -huh. of rice. Okay. So sometimes people also are, are, you know, some are enthused about the fact that, look, it smells, it's just this thing about the smell of it. I'm happy about that. Mm. Um, so yes, so that's, like I said, when you even get on the field, even after a month and a half, when the wind blows, you just get this nice whisk of air. Mm. So why, how did you decide to go for quality? Because the average African brand is mediocre. I agree. You know, and now it's gotten to a point where if it's made in Africa, we don't want to buy. 
rather buy even though a lot of the stuff that comes in is also mediocre because <laughs> yeah because they they send the lower grades yep, to us yep, um, <laughs> yep. uh, so how are you able to or why do you decide that you know what i'm going to build a brand that is quality um and i want to recreate i want people to see africa as a continent that can actually bring out quality yeah why is that important for you i think is this one of those things where I think all the experiences you've had in life some way somehow make sense eventually. Mm. And you see as we go around the farm, you see some major construction work going on, which is like, okay, I'm able to do that because of my real estate background. Yeah. I'm able to, I know what, I, I have been in the US. I have spent time in the US. I've been to China. I've been to the UK. I have seen what it looks like to build, to, to see foreign brands mm -hmm. and in fact it's, a, it's that exact statement i've always known africa was rich i just felt like we weren't telling enough of the we weren't showing forth enough of the richness of the african culture mm. and the richness on the african continent mm. and so it was actually an intentional decision to actually have grass because you know what ghana is actually the center of the world no offense to nigeria but in reality the center of the world is right here in ghana no so this is all i'm saying mm -hmm. We have this idea of why don't we go rise from the center of the world to the ends of the world? Okay. Showing forth the richness of the African culture, mm -hmm. not only in the soil, but also just in the brain. Mm. Look at the beauty of African print. Very colorful. The very beauty beautiful. of like African mm. kaftans. I look, I'm the type who even my entire time in the U.S., every Friday, because in Ghana, we have this thing on Fridays where we have a Friday way. Yeah. You're supposed to wear so traditional stuff. Yeah, exactly. We do it in Nigeria, too. I was doing that in America. So even in the U.S., while I was in school, on Friday, you would see me only wearing African, African stuff. Friends. And the beauty of it was just seeing how many friends of mine wanted what we had. Mm. So whenever I was coming on vacation, I had to always take some of that back to them. And it was with that same model that I thought, if we produce anything here, mm -hmm. it must be that quality that must be able to go to the end of the world. And that was really the ethos around it. So you see anything with the, with the packaging, with the design of the farm, whatever we're doing, the question was, how, is, how does it look like in China? How does mm. it look like in Brazil? How does it look like in India? When it's put on the shelf versus... Exactly. That, and that's why Chinese it's called Nanesweiss. It's not called Nanesweiss because of my name. Oh. I always like to correct that. Okay. I'm not I the type who's like... No, it was not. The most common Ghanaian name you'll find is Nana. Nana. Uh, if I you met Kofi, no. If you met <laughs> Kofi, Kofi is actually the name for any Ghanaian born on Friday. Ah, any male Ghanaian born on Friday. Okay. So if you meet any male who what was born Kwe on Wednesday. <laughs> okay. So there is Kojo, which is for Monday, Kwabna for Kwabna, Tuesday. Kwabna, I know Kwabna. Yes. So those okay. are day names. Okay. But most even people who call themselves Kofi they or Kwame, name. they call themselves Nana Kofi, Nana okay. Kwame, okay. Nana. So you realize. That, and Nana applies both male and, and female. female. Okay. So I realized, look, if you wanted a name that most people will know where the product came from, you have to use, you have to use a that name local. that they can't mistake. Exactly. Oh. And so Nana was that name that, you know, Nana is a name that in other countries, like, you know, in China and stuff, they, they say, oh, I call grandma Nunu or Nuna. Or, mm. So it was a very easy name for people to pronounce because yeah. you don't want a name that is so local that a that foreigner... can't pronounce. Exactly. Yeah. So that was really the ethos around... You know, naming it naming Nana's rice. rice, you know, so clearly made really, from Ghana. So that's really, is really local. Yep. And from the beginning, okay. the goal was, this pouch must be seen in shops in Holland. That was just what I said from, from day one. Mm. That I want a product that we can take right from here and display in a, in a, in a, in a shop in, in Holland. And so that has always informed, I think. And today we actually export both to Belgium, to Germany, to the US, the UK, even to China. Interesting. So we are happy to be a, a, an export. Don't be many people talk about importing everything from China. We yeah, also export exporting. rice to, to China. That, that's so. great. Um, so let's look at the business, right? Because I feel like there's two parts. There's the farming mm -hmm. and then there's the business, the business. of the product itself. Mm -hmm. um, so how are you able to manage profitability seeing as you went to the model that there's, lo there's loads of people splitting? Mm -hmm. the money so how are you able to manage profitability mm -hmm. so i use what you, you are familiar with this family and friends rounds mm. so well family friends and fools so the, the, the people who are foolish enough to trust me um was how i started 
So um, come, having come from the U.S., I had quite a bit of uh, friends from there, um, family members, um, my aunts, uncles. So what I did is, you know, when I started with the two people, I needed about $2,000 in the beginning. Okay. That I self-funded. So again, I had a real estate business. So my real estate business was you able to, money. you know, yeah. get started. When I did that, I saw the numbers. So then I knew, okay, my margins here are about 40%. Is it possible for me to go get money from a friend who was willing to give me money? And then I gave them, let's say, 20%. Okay. Just in case, you know, there were any margins of error, you know, in case anything didn't go well, we had a bad season or whatever. Mm. So that's what I started to do. So I went to people, I have a lot of promise me notes okay. in the beginning. So I come to a friend who says, hey, you know, and, and I also had a lot of friends who contacted me about making investment decisions. You know, hey, I'm thinking about moving to Ghana. You know, what, what has your experience been? I said, look, don't move first. You need to send your money to work for you <laughs> so that you are able to, you know, by the time you come back, you have something, you have something yeah. in case things don't go as well. Yeah. So most people wanted to, when most people said they wanted to move back, they felt like there was something they could give to the community. And my thought to them was like, if you come back, you spend that money on yourself. For now, let's try to make a difference Invested. in the life of five people, 10 people. So I had a price per hectare. Okay. So it was about $1,200. So if you give me $1,200, then I'm able to give you back 1000 whatever. Mm. So it was a margin for them. So okay. people would then say, okay, fine, and I want to do two hectares. Okay. And then I want to do three hectares. I want to help four farmers. So I had the numbers like that. Okay. So that was how I began. Mm. And of course, over time, I then continued to, you know, collect some of those um, profits. Again, like I said, I started out, my, my real estate business is not, it's not dead. Mm. I just focused less on it. So I had an apartment complex going on at the time. I started an apartment complex 2016. So by 2018, 2019, I was completing that apartment complex. So it coincided again with COVID. So as I sold those properties, I just took a lot of that money, didn't reinvest in building new apartments. Mm. So I moved a lot of that capital into the agriculture business. Because by then, I had done a lot of promissory notes. I tested the model. People were happy. You know, they had sent money. They were being paid back. They could see the difference because I was taking pictures, sharing that with them. Mm. And so that's kind of how we kind of build out the, the, the model. And we, look, we're still looking for money. So, <laughs> so it's not all rosy. And again, I think we did things little by little. It, okay. I think we looked good because of just how we did it. We started helping farmers. Mm -hmm. It wasn't all our risk. Farmers were taking some, some of the risk. risk. You know, I got the produce. We had good packaging. The product itself was good. So people just loved ordering from us all the time. So I always had more orders than I had rice. So I was never really tight in terms of, I was rather controlling. Because what I, what I wanted to make sure happened was, whatever people say, you know, local rice, you start to you like it, and then later they change the quality, or later you ask and you don't have it. Mm. So I wanted to make sure that was never, that was never a, case. a case. So we always managed our customers. I always had a sense of their database. So I always knew how many customers we had, how many products we needed to have before our next harvest period, mm. so that people never wanted rice and didn't so get it. So it was not it. out of stock. No. Fantastic. So how, how did you market the brand in the beginning? Like, how did you get people to drop foreign rice or other locally made brands and buy Nana's rice? WhatsApp status. I started from my WhatsApp status, my own WhatsApp status. And I think the difference for me is since I started eating this in 2018, I do not eat any other rice besides what we, we grow. What do you grow. Not even what I grow, what even the smallholder farmers grow. Because again, the quality is great. Mm -hmm. So... I guess I eating it myself, I shared that on my WhatsApp status. I sold all my 30 bags. My first harvest, I had about 36 bags. Mm. Sold all of it in like two hours. Oh, wow. So from then, then I had to rebrand. So if you, there's, a, there's a picture of like my old rice old packaging, packaging and then a new one, it was not thought through. I, I just, I ate the rice, I loved it. And I just thought, hey, let me share some with some of my friends. And that was how that kind of um, happened. And so it's, it's one of those things where... The market is always there. The market is always available. Once mm. we produce, continue to produce that quality, they're always ready to take it from us. So quality is, is what you say has pushed the brand uh, yes. in. Yeah. Um, so if I look at your distribution chain, I see that you know it's in loads of um, stores in Accra mm -hmm. and across a couple of countries. Mm -hmm. But I don't see any other African country on that list. Yes. Why? Thank you why, very why much. Why are you not in Nigeria? Thank you, thank you very much for asking <laughs> why me are you this not question. In, in Senegal? Why Let me not tell in Morocco? You. Let me tell you. In fact, I just got back from Abidjan last month. We started from Abidjan because they were so close. Okay. Oh, yeah, they're just next Surprisingly, door. it is cheaper and easier for me to send rice to, Europe. to China than to Abidjan. 
Oh, wow. The cost of me sending rice to Abidjan, logistics, mm. is the price of the product. Oh, wow. So for me to wow. send a kilo of rice to Abidjan is the price of one kilo of rice. So what, what, what that means for me is what I sell in Ghana for, mm. I have to sell twice Double that in price. Abidjan. Mm. And how much am I going to give to my Abidjan partners? Mm. So what we did was we started out doing a test. So we sent out product to Abidjan. You know, at first the price was high, but we thought, okay, you know what? The volumes are not much, so let's pay for it. So then we had a team in Abidjan who did a taste test. So they bought other rice, rice brands because they wanted yeah. to know if this is something that was selling in Abidjan. We won that, mm -hmm. hands down. Every single person who tasted it, we Take had... your brand. We, we were good. Mm. So then the, guy, the guys were happy. We thought, look, we are good. We are now going to be in Abidjan. Well, there's a blow. Oh. Like. <laughs> so they placed their first order. It was about a thousand bags. I could not deliver it. Oh. The product value value that they had to pay to me was same. how much they had to pay, pay for just for shipping it and so that's mm. a challenge i would love to be in abidjan and in nigeria mm. and in senegal in Liberia, even yeah. in togo oh, around you but yeah. i can't so there's there's a lot of conversation around continental free trade i'm like i'm living it if today indeed the borders were open where i have fda certification in ghana mm -hmm. I'm, I'm allowed, allowed in, in, to, in, in, to sell go into in Côte d'Ivoire. Mm -hmm. I already have buyers in Côte d'Ivoire. We even had supermarkets who wanted the product. So the guys were good. We had worked out their margins, how much they'll make. The only challenge was on logistics. And I even think that the, a big, a huge business opportunity for many people would be to figure out mm, how just for us to distribute stuff yes. amongst ourselves. Uh, yeah. Because for my Belgium, Germany, psh, Place the order. So it's sea freight yes. there. Yeah, yeah. We, sea freight. Some, we even have orders in Japan. And some people, some Africans. So thankfully, I'm selling to Africans in Belgium and mm -hmm. Germany. Mm -hmm. So some Africans who are not even Ghanaians are buying. Mm -hmm. Some people are even willing to pay for the air freight. So we do have a few customers here and there who the order and say, hey, send it to me. And then they pay the air freight. Mm -hmm. For them, some of them, I think it's just a commitment to supporting support Africa. Africa. So, mm -hmm. so, but I think that I would love to be able to sell locally. Mm. I'd love to be able to sell in. In fact, I even it's more difficult convincing fellow Ghanaians, sometimes even in other regions, to take my product over taking an imported brand. So Africans, we have some work to do, mm. in all honesty. It shouldn't have been difficult. It shouldn't be. Here I am employing local people, um, spending local um, currency. If I sold to my fellow Africans, Selling in local currencies, mm. but here yeah, I keeping am keeping the wealth within. Yeah. But here I am having to export that to um, people in the diaspora. So yeah. that's my situation now. I even have someone who contacted me just yesterday. He wants to buy all our December stock that I I intended to sell locally. Mm. He wants to buy all of it and sell it in the UK. Oh wow! That's how much some of them are more interested in doing what we are doing. Than we are. I have hope in the future of the African, uh, the future yeah. of the African. I know you already wrote down a full notebook because you're getting so many nuggets from today's guest. But before we go further, I wanted to share with you an amazing feature that our sponsor for this episode has. Now, traction apps have so many solutions for businesses to help you grow, right? But the one we're focusing on today is the financial payment solution. Many customers, especially in this part of the world, refuse to pay with card. Maybe for fear of fraud or they don't even have a card. Now the alternative is bank transfers. And the hazards to that is they may have to wait endlessly before the payment is confirmed or you are left with a fraudulent transaction. It happened to me recently. I wanted to eat shawarma. Ladies and gentlemen, I waited over an hour before that payment was confirmed. And by that time, my query is already gone, right? But you don't need to take your customers through all of these hassles. All you need to do is go and download the Traction apps. Yes. One, download the app. Two, fill your KYC. Three, open a fixed account. That is it. And ensure that you enable bank transfer on your account that is all now what it helps you do is one even if your business is not registered you can get a what a corporate account name 
many of you all don't get some businesses because you're still sending your personal accounts so you don't need to have a registered business to have a corporate account with traction apps so that's one two is you get alerts you get bank payment confirmation within 30 seconds once they make the payment just go to your dashboard within 30 seconds you get the alerts so that frees up the time your customer would have spent waiting and also helps you get in more business so go to the link in this video description click on it and get started or you go to the app store download the app make sure you use my code trisha bees because when you use my code you're going to be getting more freebies because you came from me good good solution now let's get back to the video for today so for this phase of growth are you looking for external investment yes yeah, so in fact we're in, the, we're in the phase of closing a, a, an external investor at the moment oh interesting our first first fantastic yep. should be fun <laughs> i'm happy I'm, I'm happier for them than, 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 than for <laughs> <Why>? me <laughs> because i know they came at the I want to say the right time. Okay. Because um, like I said, thankfully we have grown organically and, and we spend a lot of time here and, you know, improving and and I feel like it's just when we're taking off where, you know, the, 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 you know, the external guys are coming in and saying, hey, then I want container loads. It's working. And of course, there's food shortage happening. Mm -hmm. So even the price of stuff are just getting it keeps increasing exactly yeah. so this would be like one of the perfect times for you to invest for, in to, for you to scale yep great so let's let's look at the product itself so you currently have two types of rice mm -hmm. long grain short grain yes okay what other products what other SKUs do you have so we have long grain we have short grain in and two of course sizes. you know in two sizes we have okay. a five kilo we have a one kilo okay and then we also have a breakfast cereal so okay. we just did a breakfast cereal last year that was our innovation um product last year so it's, that's that's with rice and soya bean okay um so that's a breakfast cereal that we've released this year we're hoping to close on the juice it may be this year or maybe next year so mm -hmm. we have like a rice milk that um, we're probably going to bring into the market but then already so there's rice is our main farm mm -hmm. but then we also have a vegetable side of the farm okay. so we have a vegetable farm we have a poultry farm we have a piggery part of that is also just provide organic fertilizer so um, we have some of those other um, livestock to be able to augment what we are doing on the rice side. Um, so for our vegetable farm, we have chili peppers. So we have powder, chili powder, we have a chili flake. We have, I'm sure you've heard of shito. Yes, yes. The black shito. pepper. Yeah. So we have uh, uh, four sauces. So we have red, green, black, and then we have what we call sweet chili. Mm. So it's like a sweet and spicy okay. um, type of sauce. So we have the sauces, we have the powder stuff so that's um dry and then we also have some wet so we have what we call a chicken marinade okay. so it's a it's a kind of marinade for chicken spicing spicing chicken and then we have sweet potatoes orange flesh sweet potatoes and one of other um, products so you have a, you have loads of products yep well, we yeah we continue to just add more to that. the yep. portfolio what's your average gross margins mm. so we have to break up the business into two Okay. So there's a farming business and then there's a food business. So the farming business sells some of our raw rice paddy mm -hmm. to the food business, but the farming okay. business can also sell some of that paddy so to an external person. So there are other local rice brands who buy from you. rice from us. And then we also sell some to our foods business, which actually produces all the... So my food business has a different person who runs that. Okay. So the margins on the farms is give or take 30 to 40-ish percent. Not then bad. the margins on the food side, because of the cycle is about 25-ish. Mm. So that goes between 15 and 25. But again, that's an FMCG. Because of packaging and distributor margins and all that. Yep. And we are we also like yeah. new entrants into the market. Yeah. But the good part there is, once you purchase, you sell almost immediately. So you're not talking 25% annually. You're talking per product. Per product. So yeah. then the turnaround time for an FMCG is a lot, it's a lot better. Mm, so even fun. there, yes, even margins of 9%, 10% work. Mm, yeah, because yeah, then yeah, yeah. all you need is enough to cover your admin cost and then everything else on top of it is, is, is um, helpful. So what challenges have you faced running the farm, running the business? Should I do a happy dance? <laughs> Should I do like a sad face? <laughs> challenges. Okay, so again, so now I've told you, there's, so there's actually a split happening. So this year... We have actually split up the company. So the farm business is separate from the food business because oh. we realized you know, our product line was growing. 
we continue to innovate around how do we improve this product, what are other things we could do with the rice, what other things we could do with the like some of the things that are waste. Our goal mm. is to reach zero waste. Um, what's the current waste percentile? 15, 20, 15 to twenty percent. That's below the average. Yep. And we That's intend good. to get we know how to get that to five. That's great. So we're going to be able to use some of even our rice husk to power our dryer that dries the rice. Uh, so we are almost getting to a point where there's nothing on the farm that goes waste. to waste. Okay. And then, of course, Brilliant. we also have the livestock. So even some of what we harvest and that's left on the field, the they livestock can, can come and then they eat it. And so uh, there's this nice, you know, ecosystem that has... That's yep. going on. Um, so that's, that's good. So once we, we've, we've done this um, um, split, I want to say on the farm side, most of the challenges have to do with rural engagement or community engagement. So it's interesting how people within the community receive someone who's not from the community, but is working in their community. Amazing. Some have a sense of entitlement. You have come to take our land. Why are you here? Mm. I will not say it's the attitude of most. And the chiefs in the community have been great, to, great and gracious toward us. And they have done well to whenever we've had an issue, they call the community and say, hey, guys, we've actually leased this land to these people, give them the maximum support. You realize how different the community gets just when that conversation happens. Mm -hmm. So with our chiefs that are on our side, it has helped us to be able to get over that initial challenge we had because we didn't know how to solve the problem. You know, you come in there and people are stealing from the, from the company. You know, sometimes you come to work and some other people from the community come and tell the workers who are from the community say, why are you working for these people, you know? You know, let's hey. go do our own thing. So those yeah. are some challenges we had. So there was some level of rural engagement here. For instance, where we currently farm, there's no electricity, there's no clean water. But again, thankfully, we have taken the approach of being a light wherever we go. And so we have like purified water that we are giving to the people in the community. Okay. We mainly use solar, solar. here. So we use solar and then people from the community can equally come and charge their phones. So these are some of the things we also do to improve that community engagement. And we, we're trying to find a way to turn that challenge to let the people in the community know, hey, we're working with we're you here. here. We're here. Um, road network was a big challenge um, okay. getting here. But again, we've tried to solve that. So we have like, um, we got a stone query and we moved material on the road so that we could now actually access, access the road it. even when it rained. So this was some of the challenges we had in the beginning mm. and then we are kind of been trying to resolve it. On the distribution side, on the food business, it's just about getting Ghanaians to buy. To buy the product. Yeah. You know, oh. so just, you know, distributors being willing to take, take a local person as opposed to the foreign brands that everybody knows. Because their point is, hey, if I buy from you, how am I sure that people would buy? Take it. So then we started giving credit. Then we realized a lot of people were defaulting on the credit. Mm. They take the credit, they sell they the sell, product, they use the money they don't for something else. Yes. Exactly. So Typical. we found out that as of last year, we said, like, guys, this is, this is becoming too much. Mm. And so we've decided now to do none of that. If you have not been with us for more than a year, if you, you are not a good, you, you can't take credit from us anymore. It's unfortunate because it would have allowed us to expand a lot quicker. Yeah. However, we, we are a little limited. Thankfully, though, what's been happening now, I don't know if it's because of people perceiving food challenges, but in the last three months, we've had a lot of people come to us and want to take up nationwide distribution. So they take from us at a slightly and lower price distribute. and then they do distribution. Yeah. They deal with all the credits. Deal with all the people. headaches. Exactly. So That's brilliant. We are inching more towards, towards that. Towards that. So what, what are you, what campaigns are you also running for the consumer end so that there's, so that there's push and pull? Yeah, I haven't done much of that. You Funny enough, that. this year, in fact, with the, with, the, with the investment we are trying to close, they realize that everybody likes the product when they try it. Mm, but but they don't know that it you exists. are not marketing. Yeah. And so a lot of that capital is also going to go towards, um, towards marketing, marketing on the, on, on on the, the food and business. Yes. Oh, brilliant. So on, on an average, how many bags do you sell a month? About 3,000 of our five kilo bags. Wow. Of our five kilo long grain bags. Okay. On the, on the cereal side, we're selling about 800 of our one kilo um, cereal so It's packs. still new. Yes, that's new. That's, okay. that's pretty new. Um, and then on the, on the other stuff, I, I don't have the numbers off the top of my head. <laughs> so the long grain is your fast moving and Fast, theory. yes. Okay. Because again, the short grain is what you realize. So, so this is the funny thing about short grain. Most middle income homes, which is, which is the income bracket we, we kind of find ourselves in, mm -hmm. because of the packaging, people just think, when it's they expensive. see the packaging, they think it's expensive. Yeah, it's an African <laughs> thing, right? Once they see, once they see good packaging, they say, like, no, no, it's too expensive. It's expensive. You don't even know the price. No, exactly. <laughs> so one of the things that we have, we have because the, the short grain is literally 
the same long grain, just that mm. in the process of milling, some of it got broken. Oh, oh. So then you put that in, a, that's half the price of the long grain. Oh. So what we are realizing is some of the, some of the, the lower income homes are comfortable taking that product. However, most of the, most of our usual customers who buy from us and buy in bulk want long grain. long grain. And so that is what is sold the most. So the short grain, we don't get to sell as much. But that's why we are doing all these things with the cereal. We're doing stuff with the milk. We may do like other products in the future. Just because the, the, the short grain, though is the same product, same value, just a little defect, we are not getting the margins on that. Mm. So we are trying to add value to the short grain to be able to sell more. So these are things that are, so I'll say that side is in the innovation phase. Okay. Whereas the long grain is set, it's a product we are happy with, everybody's happy with, and we are selling that in, in large volumes. Do you have bigger sizes that go into trade? We want like to. The yes. Open markets. Yes. So, so lately, schools have started contacting us, some restaurants contact us. For them, we don't have to put it in our packaging. Yes. We just take it in 50, kilis, 50 kilo sacks, 25 kilo sacks. Oh, but okay. I, I, I like those customers because then I <laughs> get to sell to them. The margins are good. And I don't have to spend on the packaging. Mm. I don't have to spend on advertising. And the idea is repeat. repeat. So, mm. for instance, when the school tells you, hey, Ganana, this is our order for the semester, I smile my way to the back. <laughs> so, yeah. Okay, so yeah, at least you get to win on the trade end and then on the consumer end yep. as well. Brilliant. So, what words do you have for, you know, businesses who are coming into two things businesses who are coming into agriculture mm -hmm. anywhere in africa mm -hmm. and then general entrepreneurs everywhere what do you have for us it, it, it may be the same it may be the same word i would give okay um think big but start small think i realize small. i realize a lot of a lot of us africans who maybe come from outside we always want to do things that big, are big grand we, you know you think you think ten thousand acres you think five th look now if i'm going to do that i have to do it big, big you yeah know, people come into me and i'm like they look now i don't want i don't want a promissory note i want to invest in the business i'm like no the business is is bigger than what i'm asking for i may come to you for five thousand dollars it doesn't mm. mean that the business that's what the business is, is worth. worth yeah so i i hear the theory and the concept around let's think big let's do big things let's follow starbucks let's be in every country let's be in every no thankfully we are we are in other regions we're in other countries i never took a flight to belgium to convince them about buying the product i never mm. took a flight to china to convince them about buying the product mm. people came and tried what we had and, and they were happy to take it and so when you think big, but you start small, you learn the mistakes because there will be mistakes. Mm. Like when we started, everything has not been rosy. rosy. Like, you know, you farm and then there was a point where cattle just came in the farm. Oh. Some people cannot take such shocks. But I never went, I never started with 10,000. Like I said, we started with two farmers. Mm -hmm. Then I worked with 25. Mm -hmm. In fact, when I, worked with 20, when I worked with two farmers, it was perfect. No losses. Nobody defaulted on, on, on their farms. When I moved to 25, four farmers did not give me produce. Till today, they owe me money. So you realize as you scale, you find the different devils. How are people, what did the four people do that the that remaining them, 21 didn't do mm, that made them probably default? default. Yeah. So we learned a little bit about the cycles. When you plant, when you harvest, you learn a lot about bird scaring. When I was working, even on that farm, when we had 60 acres, we control the birds because one of the challenges with grain production is birds come birds, and eat the product. Come and peck on it. When oh. we're at 60 acres, oh, we control that. We employed a lot of people, they work for us. When we scale from 60 to 150, I will need about 400 people to work on the farm for about 60 days to prevent right. birds. So that's a different challenge. Uh. And so you realize that if you do not scale gradually, somebody may sit down and think, hey, you know, let's go big. And then you may meet like and then challenges. You meet like a lot of losses. Exactly. Yeah, like I challenges. said, even on our food business, when we started, we thought, okay, the people say they don't know our product, but we know the quality of our product. Let's give it to them. They'll buy. They'll, when, they, when the people come and buy from them, they they'll will pay us. Back, Guess yeah. what? They come, they buy, but they don't pay us. Yeah. So now here you are saddled with debt. So you have sold the product. Customers are happy with you, but, but you, you don't, don't have, have money, money in the bank. Yeah. So I would say, you know, always think big. Start small. My method of starting small is always have a pilot program and mm. scale up that pilot program. And then, you know, very soon, we should reduce our microwave mentality. It's like, oh, you know, let me Fast, put it in. Quick. Three minutes, 
Yeah. I'll be a, I'll be a hitman. I'm somebody sitting down there calculating. Hey, so if one bag is this much, then wow, this guy's really yeah, making money. Making lots of money. <laughs> <laughs> no, um, the Excel sheet is not what goes on on the ground. Mm. So yeah, fantastic. Those so think big, start small. Yep. Um, what's the business value there currently? Mm. So now I said our business is divided. Mm, the and I'll give you I'll the give food. you the valuation at which we were we are closing with For the one investment. of our one of our with our farm business we are about two million ish two million dollars. dollars. Okay. Now that valuation is funny. Because, Why? <laughs> <laughs> because what has happened is when we broke up the business and we shared with somebody who wanted to come in, but he didn't have the money. Mm. He said, Nana, your phase one is valued at four million. And he told me how he did that valuation. And I hear him because his point is your stuff you have learned. Because in in in, in African valuation, we mm. don't this two million we talk about is there real there's no intellectual oh, assets. There's intellectual. no they just talk about assets. Okay, okay, how much land is it? How yeah. much did he buy the land? There's no there's little said about how do I how did I plan the irrigation system? Mm. There's nothing said around how did he get the road that leads to the property? Because these are not things that are directly tied to Direct the business. Cost, yeah. So I don't think that African companies understand yet valuation. valuation. And I'm fine. And that's why I told my the, the, the company that's coming in now that it's good. I'm happy for them to come in. Then they would they would work on the next valuation. Because I, I, I'm not, I don't build the business every day thinking about yeah, valuation. Yeah. I, I'm just building the business, trying to you know, grow it and just get it done. But these external investors who are coming in, their focus is going to be, how do we grow our portfolio? Mm -hmm. They are thinking, how do we do 10x of what we gave to them? Mm -hmm. And I'm, my answer to them is, it's your it's story your about <laughs> how I'm just working. You guys give me the money, let me, let me expand, let me grow. Mm -hmm. But then it will be their headache to, 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 to handle. Yes. So they will come in and talk about, well, do you know how many years it took Nana to learn how to do rice? For instance, I spent a month in Brazil with my farm manager, precious manager, just learning. What okay. we learned is not in any paper. It can be. It's not in any book. Mm -hmm. So if you like, you come and take the farm, we will go somewhere else and we will scale up. So those are the things that are currently not part of our valuation, but it's fine. So on the farm business, it's about two million. And on the foods business, it's about three million. Ish. Okay. So, so on an average, five million. Yes. Great. Yeah. Okay. Well, um, my last question will be: What's the importance of learning? Because now we just see business owners. Oh, I have a passion for this, and then they just jump right into it and try to figure it out. Um, but from your own experience, you know, having to go and learn, um, learning through failure, learning through the small farm holders. Mm -hmm. How? What do you think is the importance of Understanding the business you are in. It's probably most important. Um, part of what has allowed us to scale like this, it's like I said, when we started working with small water farms, it was not big. When you're talking 10,000 acres, it's a different beast. Yeah. And so we actually are paying top dollar to have Brazilians who I have found have similar tropical challenges to, to like Africa. And then they also have large scale farms. So we actually went and got two Brazilians to come and train me on almost everything I know about rice farming. Uh -huh. So before they were here with me, just telling us, hey, this is where your canal what should you pass, this is what needs to happen. Mm. Don't do plant transplanting at this scale. You need to do broadcasting. These are ways to control. And a lot of what they have even taught us, no other person knows because they don't have commercial scale farms for rice. Mm. So then we spent a lot of time just learning from them since 2018 till now. We got um, full-time Brazilian one full-time Brazilian working for us in 2020. Okay. And then we had a consultant for, for a while. And then we got two of them now. And then we realized, look, we've learned a lot from them, from what they tell us. It's important for us to go to their country and learn from other commercial scale rice farmers yeah. on how they how do it. Done. And yeah. honestly, it was eye-opening. Like I spent with, with my team, we're, about, we're there for a month. We visited the largest rice farm in Brazil. Um, we learned a lot about him, how he managed to be there. No. no. So thankfully, we got some equipment from, from one of the guys there. And okay. so we connected with the guy That's that, hey, we want to come in and we want to come in. So he arranged everything. Okay. We visited multiple commercial scale farms. And these guys are open. Mm. They are very ready to show you what they have. how they, And even three of them are willing to come to Ghana and come see what we have. Thankfully, I went there with some drone shots. We went to some of our rice. They were impressed. Mm. Like the Brazilian guys were super impressed about 
wow, this you're saying this came from Ghana. We are, we are, we are, we are happy to say yes, this came right from, from Africa. So we visit farms and we also visit processing companies to learn both about the farming side and the, the, the food side. Okay. So that's this I mean, a lot of what we see today is coming from a lot of learnings. And we've right. not we've not stopped learning. Mm. Is, yeah. it, is the processing done here? Yes. Okay. So not on my field, it's done in Ghana, but okay. we currently outsource that to a different company. Okay. We don't have our own processing unit yet. We're Fantastic. hoping to raise funds for, for, for that as well. All right. It's been great chatting with you. Thank it's you very much, Risha. Really eye opening. Thank it's been you a for pleasure. having us here. Welcome. All Akwaba right. to Ghana. <laughs> so guys, we'll see you on the next episode of How They Did It with Trisha Biz. Peace out.